Welcome to La Trobe University in Melbourne. My name is Jan Libich, and I'm thrilled to be joined by uh, an esteemed economist, Dr. Liam Lenton. Uh, welcome, Liam. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're here today to talk about the world's most popular sport, football, or soccer, as some prefer to call it, and specifically about one aspect that uh, many fans and especially administrators find very frustrating. Uh, the penalty shootouts in, in knockout stages tournaments such as the, the FIFA World Cup. Liam, can you document this frustration for us? Uh, Certainly. Um, th first of all, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, probably along with diving, I think that's, if you ask most fans what their bugbears about the game that they love are, they probably nominate, yes, diving and also penalty shootouts. Uh, let's be clear about this. There are a lot of people out there who would proudly say that they like penalty shootouts, but there are certain problems with it that both fans and administrators tend to um, admit that, 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 that do exist with them. The, the FIFA president had this famous quote. Uh, uh, after a couple of months after the 2006 World Cup, where the final, as a lot of people out there will recall, between Italy and France ended in penalty shootouts. And uh, the Secretary General's response to this was to say, something along the lines of, uh, when it comes to the World Cup, it's a passion. When it goes to extra time, it's a drama. But when it goes to penalty shootouts, well, then it's a tragedy. Tragedy. Mm. Um, well, I mean, this, this immediately brings to mind the, you know, the tearful face of John Terry after missing a, a penalty kick uh, uh, in the 2008 uh, UEFA Champions League final. And I'm sure you have your favourite moment as well as our audience, so yeah. can you... Well, for mine, Jan, uh, the, the one that you just can't beat is the forlorn face of Roberto Baggio after the 1994 World Cup final, but the instances of this are very numerous. Can you guys think of any famous uh, missed penalty shootouts uh, that, that spring to mind? Uh, any names? The Champions League final, um, Bayern Munich versus Chelsea. And um, the German players definitely were devastated afterwards. Man, and everything was oh, hanging was in a, the balance in one person. That was a sad one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we, can, we could, we could uh, uh, name, name any others. So um, I know you, I mean, you're, you're an economist, uh, and I know you like sports, mm. but uh, what, what's your interest in, in researching uh, football? Well, for this particular idea, yeah, and it was pretty much the same as yours, right? I know that. You love talking about incentives in very different terms to how I like to talk about them. Uh, in my case, it's with respect to rules in sporting contests and uh, rules and regulations that are set forth by sporting administrators and so on. In your case, it's more to do with central banking. But uh, I felt that there was a bit of common ground there, and that's why I, uh, well, we approached each other, I guess, in a sense, to try and put some scientific rigour to this possible idea that we're going to be discussing a little bit mm. later on, or I assume you're going to be asking me on a so, little so bit So what, what is the problem with the penalty shootout in the first place? I mean, uh, well, you know, where's the tragedy? Well, first of all, there's this, um, this perception, if you like, that the outcome of the shootout is merely a lottery. Some people would dispute this, but if you look at aggregate level of um, let's say who the home team is and who the away team is or the favourite versus the non-favourite, when you look at large aggregate lots of data, typically the outcome is very, very close to 50-50 anyway. So even if there are perceptions that some teams always tend to win in penalty shootouts and others tend to lose, the, there is still a huge perception out there that the uh, outcome is indeed a lottery. And I think more generally the, the problem that a lot of fans have with penalty shootouts is that it's not really a true separation of the two teams on the basis of the quality of play during the game. That um, it only really tests a very small subset of the player's skills and it's not really, in, 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 mm. in all things being considered a satisfactory way to end the contest where we would prefer the outcome to be decided in open play. And um, I suppose Seb Blatter really meant also the, the emphasis and the, the pressure that it puts on the individual player as opposed to the, the team, you know, that can really scar the... Yeah, definitely. The FIFA are acutely aware of this problem and uh, recently... Have they, have they tried to fix it? In, any in, in the past, well, yes, they tried. Uh, many fans out there will recall the golden goal rule, which basically added a sudden death 
element to extra time in these knockout matches. And the idea behind it was pretty sound, right? That uh, by having sudden death, you basically cut out a certain type of match from going to penalties, that being where one team scores and then the other team equalises. If you give the other team no opportunity to equalise, then it's not going to go to penalties anyway. Uh, but that caused a lot of other problems that they didn't foresee. Um, mainly that it made both teams a lot more defensive than they were previously. And the reason for that was that compared with the previous rule, which is now again the current rule, where you don't have sudden death, the opportunity cost, if you like, of conceding a goal was far greater insofar that you didn't get a chance to equalise now. And that defensive effect actually overwhelmed that apparently other positive effect that it was supposed to generate. And as such, it undermined its own intention. So, so basically the intention was that if you, if you increase the reward for scoring mm. people, you know, the teams are going to be more offensive. But what they didn't take into account sufficiently that not only you increase the, the <laughs> reward for scoring, but you also increase the, the, the punishment for, for conceding a goal. And the, that exactly. So in advance, there wasn't a full consideration of the possible incentives involved of moving towards such a rule. Uh, but as I mentioned before, they're still acutely aware of this problem. And recently, uh, Blatter set up a task force headed by none other than German legend Franz Beckenbauer to try and come up with a the solution looking forward to this apparent problem of the penalty shootout. So if we were to help Beckenbauer, what are the solutions that have been floating around? What are the mm. alternatives uh, that can replace Yeah, them? ones that I've heard for years include the idea of during extra time taking a player off from both sides every, let's say, five minutes during extra time. So That's, the that's reminiscent of ice hockey or some competition. Yeah, they take, uh, in NHL, I think they take one player off from, from both sides. And the idea there is just to create more space, right? So there's uh, greater attacking opportunities and greater <coughs> propensity for teams uh, to score. But unfortunately, there are certain occupational health and safety issues, mm. right? It puts at risk um, players' welfare, not just a higher risk of injury, but overall welfare. So the sports scientists tend to agree that this would not really be an acceptable uh, solution to the shootout problem. Any so, other alternatives? That you um, yeah, look, uh, I've, I've heard of um, other proposals whereby that if the game is still tied at the end of extra time, that you look back on the match statistics and award the game, if you like, to the team that, let's say, had the most corners or the team that had more possession or the team that had the most shots on target. Uh, the problem, well, yeah, I think you know where this is going because you know incentives quite well, is that uh, micro theorists out there who might be watching this will know that this is a manifestation of the Lucas critique, right? That by, um, by generating a situation whereby the players know this before they start the game, you run the risk of reducing the game as a spectacle because if they know that the team will be awarded the, the contest if it's drawn is the team that had the most shots on target, you might alter behaviour that teams might and players might take shots on goal that otherwise they wouldn't have. They're just trying to get the statistic up in mm. case it's a draw at the end. And we really don't want that at all. So that as an alternative would also be an unacceptable um, alternative to the status quo. So what, what uh, kind of alternative avenue does this project uh, consider? This isn't necessarily a new idea and it's not our idea certainly, but the idea is that we simply alter the sequence of events, that you move the penalty shootout, you retain it for sure, and it does play some role in determining the winner if the, the game is drawn after 90 minutes, but that you have it prior to extra time. And the idea behind that is that the penalty shootout will result in a winner and that essentially you're deciding the tiebreaker um, before extra time and then you play extra time as you currently do but that both teams know in advance of extra time that if extra time ends up being drawn who is the winner. Okay so you've got the 90 minutes uh, regulation time then you have the penalty mm -hmm. shootout then you have the, the extra time. And mm. so when is the result of the uh, penalty shootout binding again? Uh, Only if the teams are level in extra time. Now, if, if extra time be... is won by a single 
uh, one of the two sides, that determines the winner, and that's no different to now. Right. Um, so the, the, the result of the penalty shootout would not count at all in that case? No, that's not the case. It, it does, uh, yeah, well, in that case, it doesn't count, but it does become binding in the event that the teams are level yes. after extra time. Exactly, and the, you know, how much you actually win the penalty shootout, whether you uh, it doesn't five, matter. that doesn't matter right. at all. The only role the penalty shootout is to hand an advantage, if you like, to one of the two teams. They do have a similar rule in fencing, and it, apparently mm. it's a very old and well-known rule. The difference with fencing is that uh, the judging panel arbitrarily award the advantage to one of the two fences involved, but then the extra time, if you like, which I believe is one minute in fencing, uh, it pretty much takes on this role, that the fencer that was not awarded the advantage, that they have to win. And that's done randomly. Extra time. Yeah, uh, or arbitrarily. So uh, it turns out that if you go back far enough, uh, penalty shootouts are certainly not nearly as old as the game itself. They were only ratified in 1970 by FIFA. So in the broad history of the game, they're, they're not actually mm. that old, so to speak. Uh, historians of the game will be aware of a match in the 1968 European Championships, the semi-final between Italy and the then Soviet Union. Uh, and this was before uh, penalty shootouts became universal and the two teams were still level after extra time, so what they did was they marched both teams back into the dressing rooms and just flipped a coin. And so that's right. very arbitrary, and that was one of the major incidences that at the time made administrators really look for a better way, that uh, made them believe that there has to be a better solution. Yeah, and generally you needed a, a, re a full replay of the game, which is very difficult. Yeah, well, well that's right. Yeah, 50 years ago the professional calendar was not nearly as cluttered as it was now, so there was greater scope for full replays of mm. matches if that was indeed the case. Uh, but certainly after the flipping the coin incident, uh, at least the improvement of having a penalty shootout compared to that was at least you were introducing mm. some element of skill. One of yeah. the things that I um, think about penalty shootouts is that it's not really that much of, a, uh, of an element of yeah. skill to it, but at least there was some element of skill to it. So it's, it's kind of uh, reminiscent of, uh, of, the, of the away rule in, in two leg series like the UEFA Champions League, right? Uh, well look, to some extent. Let, let us make this clear, they're, they're very independent rules they're designed to look after different aspects of the game. But you're right in so far that there's a commonality of deciding the secondary tie-break criterion and that that being known before the players step out onto the park. Mm. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this rule now, bringing mm. the penalty shootout before, before extra time. There's been some economics literature that has actually looked at the at the, at the impact and try to predict what, what mm. effect it would have. Can you uh, tell us yeah, a little bit there, about that? There's a um, notable professor in micro theory by the name of Juan Carrillo. He's at the University of Southern California. And he published a paper in the Journal of Sports Economics in 2007. What he, what he showed with his micro theory model was that you would have two opposing effects. Now he came up with this equation and in micro theory we say that the outcome, whether it's one way or the other, depends on the relative magnitudes of the parameters you put to the model. But the underlying story behind it is that if you have the penalty shootout before extra time, you'll have a winner and a loser, right? Now compared to the status quo where you have extra time and you don't know what's going to happen thereafter mm. with the result, is that you'll have these two opposing effects. Now, one is that the team that loses the penalty shootout before extra time will then become more attacking in extra time than they would be under the current rule of because course, they yeah. know they have to score. If right. they don't score, even if extra time finishes nil-nil, they still lose. Now, the offsetting effect is that the team that wins the penalty shootout, they'll become more defensive under the rule proposal than what they would be under the status quo for the inverse reason. They know that if they can stop the other team from mm -hmm. scoring, they win guaranteed. And so what really matters in an empirical sense is which of those two effects is dominant. And that's what we set out to do with this particular project. And to so try and put an, an empirical answer on Juan Carrillo's methodology. And so what, what's the data that 
that, that is used in the project. Well, we were lucky enough to come by a huge database uh, that was given to us by a couple of um, <coughs> brothers in the Czech Republic that uh, run their own website where they supply sports uh, data to bookmakers. It had over a half a million football results and most importantly for our purposes it included minute by minute data on scoring but also other characteristics of the game whether it was a neutral game or home ground advantage um, bookmakers odds which is very important to us because we need some way of quantifying how evenly matched the the two teams are or the perceptions of how evenly matched the two teams are and so on now the lion's share of those matches are league matches we're more interested in knockout phase tournaments Playoffs, so yeah. Uh, let's say in the FIFA World Cup, anything from the second round onwards or the round of 16 onwards, we're not so interested in the group phase matches because they're not knockout matches. So by the time we get down to um, knockout phase matches that then proceeded to extra time because they were drawn after 90 minutes, we have a much smaller set, but nevertheless, we were very lucky to have um, access to this database because it really allowed us to drill into this uh, data to try and answer this question. So give us the, the punchline. What's the uh, what's the verdict? What what would the what would be the impact that the new rule? Okay. So um, look, we, we looked at three different objectives uh, to measure how this rule would perform. The one out of those three that we decided to run with was the number or proportion of games in which at least one goal is scored in extra time as a proxy for attacking intent and attacking play by teams. Uh, on this basis, if you look at uh, basically all, all, all over data, right, all of these matches from huge um, databases, what we currently find is that in nearly 50% of all matches, extra time does not produce one single goal. Our results indicate so, so that... So this is, can I just, so this is basically the most boring 30 minutes you can think of where both teams are sitting back and defending. Not in all of those cases, but certainly in a proportion of, of those cases. And that's the kind of scenario that we'd like to eliminate via a rule that does away with those possible perverse incentives to just sit back and the other team sit back and then you just passing the ball around for 30 minutes waiting for extra uh, or waiting for the penalty shootout anyway. That's what we don't want. Um, not the case in all of them, but yeah, certainly nearly 50%, nearly one game in every two, we don't get a single goal in extra time. Mm. Our results indicate that if we introduce this rule, that that proportion would fall to under 25%. Okay, so you get rid of half of those boring games. Exactly. Uh, or another way to put it, one game in every four, would not produce a goal under the current rule, but would produce at least one goal under this proposed rule. Okay. Now, but I mean, uh, I think our audience might be wondering, how did you actually uh, come up with this uh, um, kind of uh, conclusion, given that this uh, proposal has never been tried? I mean, the rule's never really been uh, implemented. So how did you... Yeah, well, that, you well, that was the challenge, of course, right? This rule's never existed, so we can't actually observe what the outcomes would be, unlike these other papers that previously looked at the effects of the golden goal rule and were able to make hard inferences on the basis of those results. But what we were able to do is estimate the, the effects by considering certain match scenarios whereby we believe that the incentives to both teams will very closely approximate what this rule would generate if it was introduced. Can you give us a, a bit more detail on okay, this? Okay, right. So what, what, what we generally tend to do is compare groups of games, right? So what we want to do here is compare a group of games that approximates the status quo, right? That you have extra time before penalties. And then with our match scenarios, which we refer to as our treatment group, we, uh, we look at scoring outcomes that come out of these situations where, yeah, again, we believe that these incentives to both teams will closely approximate what this rule would do and see if the scoring outcomes in the latter group of games is higher than the, or, or better than the control. Can you be a little bit more specific? So what, what exactly is the... Uh... Well, multiple ways of doing it. What we started with 
is to look at games that do go to extra time and look at the first, let's say, X minutes of extra time. We started with five, right? So we'll just go with this scenario to begin with. Now, if one of the two teams scores a goal in the first five minutes of extra time, we, we consider that to be one of our treatment games. Now, the reason for that is as follows. And by the way, we then look at what happens in the consequent 25 minutes of extra time. Um, think about what would happen if one of the two teams scores in extra time. That's very close to the scenario where you have the penalty shootout before extra time and, and you've got a winner, right? In so far that the team that concedes a goal in the first five minutes of extra time has that similarity to mm. the team that loses the shootout before extra time in they so far that they have to then. score. Yeah. They have to go all guns are blazing for the remaining 25 minutes. In terms of uh, maybe some differences, obviously one of the differences, and maybe we can discuss it a little bit later, mm -hmm. is that if you uh, win the penalty shootout, or if you lose the penalty shootout, then you can o only score one goal and you, you we win the tournament. You leap wins. ahead of the opposition, whereas the scenario that we describe as our treatment, if that team that's gone behind then scores, they only draw equal. But for my, the way I view it is that either way, the effect that the team gets eliminated if they don't score is the predominant effect anyway. So uh, for my money, this is a, still a very close approximation of what so, that rule would do. So can you now compare what happens in the remaining 25 minutes or the treatment where there was an early goal and or the control where there was no early goal. Can you tell us about the scoring probabilities? Or yeah, um, well, look, there are many scenarios, right? So uh, let me put some numbers to it. Let's just say that you're considering a certain tournament. Um, we'll, we'll start with a one-leg tournament, like let's say the knockout stage of the FIFA World Cup, just to make it easier for everyone. Consider that you've got two teams that are evenly matched. So to help us uh, visualise it, I guess, let's consider Italy and Germany, for example, that have a comparable level mm. of pedigree, I guess, in the history of the game. The next World Cup will be in Brazil, so this will be a neutral match for, for both of those teams. And let's just say it's at the, the quarter-final phase. Uh, so this is a nice benchmark case, and I've got some figures here from the paper that help us illustrate what would happen, uh, that in the control group, under the current rule, the probability of at least one goal being scored, which is our dominating uh, objective, would be around about 35%. Now in our treatment group, that probability increases to approximately 62%. That you, are you assuming anything on the score in the regulation time? Is this dependent uh, on it? Yes, it is dependent on that as well. So um, the, the, the figures that I just gave you assume that the 90 minutes is scoreless, which in a match between Italy and Germany is certainly conceivable, right? Um, if alternatively the match uh, finished at, let's say, 3-3 instead in, in the 90 minutes, it's, it's easy to see how both of these probabilities would be higher than in the previous case because presumably this is a game where it's very tactically open, both teams are already showing a lot of attacking intent. intent. Uh, those corresponding probabilities would be 68% under the status quo, rising to 86% if the rule was introduced. Okay, so you already, under the current rule, you would already have a lot higher scoring probability in extra time in such an open game, but mm -hmm. that would still increase uh, under, the, under the alternative Well, well that's rule. right. So s presumably that second scenario, the need for that rule isn't as great, but if it's introduced, it's still doing a pretty good job of eliminating a lot of the remaining games that still aren't generating at least one goal in extra time anyhow. Mm. So if we change some of the, the features that you outlined, mm. if we make one team, uh, say, a 2-1 two, two favourite, would that change the, the scoring probabilities in extra time under the, the current rule and under the alternative rule? Yeah, theoretically it, it should. Uh, both of the probabilities again should rise because if you've got one team that's reasonably heavily favoured over the other one, and look, you know, we're still looking at games that go to extra time. So even though they're a better team than the other team, they weren't able to make that count in the 90 minutes. But in that case, well, that team that's, you know, that, that, that's uh, uh, perceptually better than the other one has an additional 30 minutes to make that advantage of 
class over their opponent count. All right, so both of those probabilities will go up. Uh, but our studies indicate that those probabilities don't change that much. Rather than the original figures of 35 and 62% that I quoted to you earlier, those corresponding probabilities are now 38 and 65%. So it doesn't make a huge impact. Mm. The probabilities are roughly comparable. But I mean, if, if we think about it, it's a, it's a big effect, right? It's almost almost a doubling of, uh, of the probability that the you will avoid a, a scoreless, scoreless extra time. Uh, so that, that seems quite a, quite, a, mm. quite a big impact. Now, it does, and um, not only that, but um, uh, with a lot of these figures, one pattern that we were noticing is consistent with the headline result that I quoted to you before, that in a lot, a lot of these scenarios, there's these 25% of matches or one match in every four that wouldn't do, produce a goal in extra time under the current rule but would under the proposed rule. If What about if we change the assumption that we're playing on neutral ground? So if we look mm -hmm. at you know some league cup like the FA Cup uh, game where it, it's played one team has the home ground advantage how would the probability you know would that be a change as well? In the Again but the figures are roughly comparable uh, taking the scenario that I stated before about Italy and Germany playing in the next World Cup in Brazil uh, you can make a slight change to that and just assume that it's something, you know, Brazil and one of those two sides, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, Brazil has the home ground advantage, the other team is the away team. Uh, it, again, it doesn't turn out uh, that the probabilities change that much. The corresponding figures would now be 37% and 60%. So again, you've got around about that remarkable consistency mm. across the board with respect to that one in four games that wouldn't achieve the desired outcome under the current rule but would under the proposed rule change. So they, you, you basically identified three main factors that, <clears throat> that are mm. kind of partial, partially substitutes for the, for the proposed rule. If, if we play at home, one of the teams is going to try harder. Mm. If we have a high scoring game mm -hmm. or if we have... Uh, um, just remind me now if uh, if the one team is a favourite, favorite. Mm. Uh, so the the, uh, the the new rule would have a smaller additional effect, but it would still have a have a sizable effect. Yeah. Uh, Certainly, in every scenario we look at across the board, the proposed rule change would lead to an improvement in those scoring outcomes, whichever way you look at it. Were there any, any other factors that you looked at that you controlled for in your empirical yes, analysis? Yes, exactly. Uh, there were, but uh, there are these couple of other factors didn't really make much of a difference. So in statisticians' uh, language, that they were ruled to be insignificant. But we also considered whether the match was an international match or whether it was a domestic match, which conceivably could have made a difference. Uh, whether it was a one-leg playoff, like the World Cup mm. knockout phase, versus two-leg playoffs, which might be the UEFA Champions League knockout phase, other than the final, which is itself a one-leg playoff, and also the round of the tournament, whether it's a round of 16 game, quarter-final, semi-final, and that's really to control for whether the stakes are increasing as you move towards the pointy end of the tournament. And these... These, uh, in most cases, these uh, variables ended up being insignificant. In, in this sort of analysis, generally, uh, the researchers provide this prediction rate. Can you just uh, tell us briefly what it is and what the prediction rate is for, for this type of analysis? Yeah, uh, so our models, our statistical models, were a class called Logit, which if anyone knows uh, anything about uh, a classical regression model, the only distinctive thing about this particular class of model is that your independent variable, which is the one on the left-hand side of the equation, in this case specifically takes the value of either zero or one. So it's a binary variable, a, a yes, no. Or in this case, whether one goal was scored in extra time or whether no goals were scored in extra time. Or the, the former case, at least one goal was scored in extra time. And so if a model has uh, if a, a model is good, that means that you could plug in all of the characteristics onto the right-hand side of the equation and use that to predict whether the value on the left-hand side will be a zero or a one. And if you get it right, well, then that's, that's a correct prediction. And so what we find in our headline uh, regression is that our prediction rate is almost 75%. And with, yeah, in a lot of bilateral contests, 
where there are certain things that you can observe about the match that will give you an advantage, you should be getting a prediction rate of 50%, otherwise it's just not a mm. good model. With respect to sporting contests, something like about 60 to 65% is an acceptable range. So for us to get a prediction rate of 75% was quite outstanding. So let us now turn from the theory to the real world. Let's mm -hmm. just think of who, um, what the impact would be uh, on, on real world countries. Who would be the biggest uh, beneficiary of this, of this system? It, it seems that whenever uh, you watch a penalty shootout, England mm -hmm. always seems to lose. <laughs> uh, at, at least that's what the, the English say. Um, well, so it depends how you phrase the question. If, if you're phrasing it in terms of future tense, well, I would say that there is no answer to that question because if England's involved in a, another penalty shootout in the future, I would say that the probability of them winning or losing it is still close to 50-50. Some people out there might disagree with this, but... Even if, if the if players nothing, even if the players believe that they can never no, win well, a penalty look, shootout? Th think about it this way. If nothing was ever to change, and yes, in future England, England will be involved in more penalty shootouts, but by the time they get to 100 of them, I can guarantee you they won't have only won 15 and lost 85, right? That probability from their past would probably converge. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the past then. What would have happened statistically? Yeah, in that framework, you can think of England being one of the major beneficiaries because I think in major tournaments, when by major tournaments I mean World Cup and let's say the, the European Championship, I think they've got something like a one in five or one in six record. I know they beat Spain mm. in they lost penalty the shootout. Five, okay. Yeah, something like that. So retrospectively, had this rule been in place, in the past, then it may very well have led to different outcomes and chances are that their winning percentage in those matches might have been closer to 50-50. Uh, the Netherlands also, they, they're mm. also well known to have an abysmal record in penalty shootouts in the past. What about the losers? Uh, who might well, have I guess lost Germany out of comes to mind, doesn't it? They've got an exemplary record in penalty shootouts and they did lose one a long time ago to your mob. That's right. Yeah, and, uh, Czech, Czech, well, Czechoslovakia back then. Uh, but since then, I don't think they've lost one you know, in 35 years. And in that time, they've won six or seven. So uh, analogously to before, again, in the future, I would say that it wouldn't necessarily be that Germany will continue to win penalty shootouts. But if we look back retrospectively on the results of those particular matches, that their record might have equivalently been closer to 50-50% compared with what we actually did see. Okay, so let me, let me turn back to the role of a, of a devil's advocate that I was supposed to be playing and, and probably not very convincingly because uh, maybe I should disclose when we started working on this project, um, I was a bit skeptical and I, I was really aware of all the mm. possible disadvantages of the rule, but the more we were looking at the data and the, the more we were considering all, all the robustness exercises, mm. the more I was becoming convinced. But let's just address some of the possible disadvantages. Um, so there's, there's obviously an adjustment cost, right? Yeah. Anytime you change any rule. Is that, do you think it's a major thing? Um, well, um, okay, so in instituting public policy change, you know, this is the, mm. the kind of thing that governments have to do. Uh, they, in selling a new policy in Australia, there was recently the, a, a big hoo-ha over the introduction of a carbon tax, right? So one of the major roles of governments is to sell their policy mm. ideas to the public. And in sport, there's this element that um, a lot of fans just don't like change. Mm. They... Uh, change in some respects is the natural enemy of getting the sports public mm. uh, to follow a sporting contest. So yes, um, if you're going to change rules, there'll be a certain subsection of the sports following public that will naturally be resistant to that change. But I'd always like to think that if you've got a really good idea for a rule change, that it won't be poo-pooed just on the basis of what mm. I always like to refer to as the tyranny of the status mm. quo, that mm. people want to keep it the same just because it was always done mm. that way. Mm. And even that argument doesn't really hold with respect to the penalty shootout because, like I said before, it isn't as old as the game itself. What about uh, the, the argument that some people might put forward that uh, the penalty <coughs> shootout becomes less dramatic because now it's got a kind of minor uh, role? Well, no, I, I wouldn't say that the role of it is minor. In fact, it's still quite significant. It's just that under this propo pr pr proposed rule change, it's no longer the 
final or ultimate act of play and it on its own doesn't determine the winner of the contest. Rather, it would play a joint role with the consequent extra time in uh, deciding the winner of that. Uh, certainly, it yeah, so in that sense, yes, it doesn't play the, the lone role anymore, but a lot of people would regard that as a good thing because one of the... One of the downsides of a penalty shootout, and we can see this in terms of press reports the following day after, after mm. these contests are decided in that manner, is that there's always this emphasis on the individual. And unfortunately, because several spot kicks are taken, the emphasis is always on the guy that missed, right? And what this would do, among other things, is give the guy who missed an extra 30 minutes to redeem himself and, or herself and, and their team. This, this would be attractive from the media perspective. Uh, maybe we, yeah. we can mention the conference. Yeah, you know, uh, we, we, yeah, so we had this conference in 2010 in London and among the other attendees was a sports journalist with the highly esteemed Times uh, newspaper from London, a guy called Tom Dart. And one of his comments about it was that in comparison to what you have under the current rule, where there is this propensity to always place a large emphasis on the story about the guy who missed or maybe less so the keeper who didn't make the save that they were supposed to make. Uh, and in some cases, if let's say that same player had done something heroic earlier on in the match, you've got that element of mm. that player going from hero to villain. Well, in this A case, the guy, who, yeah, the guy who missed could actually end up scoring the winning goal mm. in extra time. And then you analogously mm. go to... Uh, that player going from the mm. villain to the hero from a journalist's perspective which is what he told us was that that's far more appealing uh, or far more an appealing thing to write about. Mm. There was uh, a, another panelist uh, that we should mention her, Henry Bertels at the, at the conference who's a, has a, a, a proponent of the rule and has been in touch uh, with FIFA about it and uh, um, one of mm. the possible downsides of the rule is, is the fact that the players may actually cool down uh, during the, the penalty kick period and then they may uh, become more likely to get injured in the subsequent extra time and and yeah. uh, so so Henry is suggesting a, a slight rule change to the uh, to the format of the penalty shootout to, to kind of alleviate that w what is it yeah uh, well if, if you were going to institute a rule change to change the sequence of events as uh, our results indicate that uh, that should be on the table, well then this would be the natural time to put all of the other technical details of the penalty shootout itself on the table as well. Uh, Henry Bertel's suggestion was that you shorten the, the, the shootout from five spot kicks per side to three, um, or even immediate sudden death, but perhaps three sounds a little bit more uh, appealing. Uh, and there are certainly other operational changes that you could make to the way penalty shootouts work in order to expedite the process of getting through it and straight into extra time. So things like how you could get the coaches to submit their order or preferential order of penalty takers to the referee before the match starts so that as opposed to the situation that you see now uh, when we know we're going to a penalty shootout, you see the coaches come on and chat to the individual players. Do you want to take one? Do you want to take one? Do you mm. want to take one? And this takes a few minutes, right? That instead what you would have is the referee immediately taking out their notepad and pointing, all right, you, down there. And you could get through the penalty shootout a lot quicker than, than we currently do. There's also a suggestion to maybe use both sides of the pitch to... Uh, to yeah, the first time I heard of this suggestion was from former England... Uh, coach uh, Glenn Hoddle and uh, that would also help expedite the process uh, by yeah sending the the players from the two different sides down to the different ends of the pitch and as soon as one penalty is taken or spot kick is taken down one end you could proceed straight to the other end as opposed to what you see now and that's that one of the keepers has to walk out the other one mm -hmm. has to walk in one penalty taker has to walk back to the center circle mm -hmm. and another, another one has to walk out so yeah those sorts of things could also be mm -hmm. um institutors changes to make the penalty uh, uh, uh shootout go faster well you you mentioned glenn hoddle he actually is a he's a supporter of this rule of bringing uh extra time uh so bringing the penalty shootout before extra time he's got a uh, a recent uh, video interview mm. where he uh, 
talks in this manner. So let's just, uh, we, we're running out of time, so let's just briefly uh, maybe summarize for the audience, summarize mm. all the, uh, the various advantages uh, that the, the proposed rule might bring to football. Okay, well first and foremost I would say that you'd get more attacking and more scoring outcomes in extra time and that was the, the focus of how we evaluated the rule and obviously we'll come back to the results at the end and, and confirm this. Uh, but an important um, caveat to such a rule change is that you get no change to the way the game is played in regulation time. I would consider regulation time sacrosanct. Extra time on the other hand, well that's merely there as a mechanism to help separate the two teams where the 90 minutes couldn't, right? So okay, I mean I they have, had 90 minutes already. I have uh, absolutely no problem with altering how extra time is played and in fact that's what we're trying to do. Um, also this notion that I spoke about at the beginning that we would prefer the game to be finished in open play would be guaranteed by mm. virtue of this rule. Um, and even for those who love penalty shootouts and uh, would, wouldn't like to see, see them uh, eliminated just because of a rule change. And let me make this quite clear, I'll, I'll go on the record, I'm one of those people. I love penalty shootouts. I was lucky enough to be in the Olympic Stadium in Sydney in 05 and saw Australia qualify for its first World Cup in 32 years via the penalty mm. shootout against twice world champions Uruguay. And nothing, I think, could ever happen in the remainder of my life that will change my opinion on this. So, yes, I am firmly in that camp. Anyone in that camp with me, what I would say to them is, well, yes, you should be a supporter of this rule change because compared with the status quo, not only will the shootout be retained, but you'll get to see them more often. Not less often, but more often. It's just that, as I said before, it, it won't be the very final act of the match, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, and also it'll build emphasis on the team rather than the individual because in that final 30 minutes of play, which is extra time after the shootout, if one of the two teams scored, well, generally, yeah, there might be emphasis on the individual again that scored, but the goal was generated by the team, generally, not, not the individual themselves. Um, yeah, and then ultimately there's this aspect of alleviating that individual tragedy, mm. again, on the, uh, the player that missed. As I said before, they do get an opportunity to redeem themselves and their team for that earlier mistake that they made, if you like, that under the current rule settings, proved to be fatal. Mm. In this mm. case, it's no longer fatal. So, Liam, if I was uh, the FIFA president, Seb Blatter, what mm -hmm. do these uh, results imply to me? What, what should be done? Well, based on our results, I, uh, I would infer that the case in favour of at least trialling this rule is very, very strong. Now, of course, you don't want to go in all guns blazing and introduce it across the board to begin with, but the general suggestion, and they did try this with the golden rule. They trialled it first in minor level, t minor, minor level tournaments. I think the first one was the World Youth Cup, the un under mm. 20 Youth Cup. See how it goes there and if it turns out that the effect that it has is according to um, uh, or is at least broadly consistent with what our results find uh, insofar that it's a good thing, then maybe introduce it universally or across the board. Okay. Well, I think it's, uh, it's time for us to hand it over to our audience if they have any questions uh, about anything we've discussed. Uh, I obviously have more questions, so we can uh, continue for a little bit. Uh, are there any questions, uh, Joe? Yeah. Um, so underlying, I think the main idea is to have more attacking play and more goals scored. That's underlying mm -hmm. the thing. Um, were, were you just looking at goals scored? Because you can have teams that play you know, can are attacking football, defensive football, but still may score goals. So is there things like maybe passes into the box or something that you also looked at to emphasise attacking play? No, we didn't look at this level of uh, statistic, Joe. Um, if it were to be trialled at minor levels, I think that that's obviously what the, um, the matrician should be looking at as a further uh, reinforcement, I guess, uh, to what you would find with the number of goals being scored. You mentioned attacking uh, or counter-attacking football. Uh, one of the elements of the effects that this rule would generate that I didn't really mention before is that if you've got the team that loses the shootout before extra time and they have to attack more, well yeah, that means that they're chucking more players forward. 
also as a result of this, they're leaving themselves more open at the back. So it could be that the team that won the penalty shootout, who's now absorbing all the pressure, they themselves, in a sense, have more scope to score a goal if they really wanted to counter-attack. So anyway, no, look, um, in such a large sample of matches, we don't have access to all of those little uh, or more minor level uh, playing statistics. But yeah, certainly if it was to be trialled and then you will have access to that, then that should be, the numbers should be crunched on those statistics alongside the statistics on actual scoring outcomes. Any other questions? Um, do you think that we would actually see a change in the results of the penalty shootouts, given that the players haven't played the extra time yet, so they're probably less fatigued and also they've got less pressure on them individually? Do you think we would see maybe um, a team that feels like they're more <coughs> superior than the other team they should score an extra time that maybe they're going to perform a little less better in the penalty shootouts or that individuals themselves should actually perform better than they have historically in the we, We've considered that there might be some kind of set, second order effects um, of, of the description that, uh, that you're asking me about. Uh, ultimately, we don't believe that any team would want to go out to a penalty shootout purposely to lose to try and create an incentive for them to attack in extra time that give any team the choice and we're talking about professionals here right these are professional athletes who le live breathe eat the game right i can't conceive of any scenario where they would purposely want to give themselves a disadvantage going into extra time hmm. And this, is, this was one of the suggestions that came up uh, during one of your seminars. Uh, an, an undergraduate student raised the possibility of staging the, uh, the penalty shootout before the game. Mm. Uh, why don't we just move it all the way before the game? And I think you, you addressed the, the question yeah. well, already. Look, um, in terms of tackling the incentive issue, it would achieve the purpose in the same sense as moving the shootout merely to before extra time. But moving it before regulation time would have a couple of downsides, and those downsides to me are quite obvious. One is that, yeah, you do run the risk of actually changing the way the game is played during regulation time. And as I said before, we should consider that sacrosanct. We don't mm. want to achieve that. And the other element to that is, why on earth would you have guaranteed penalty shootouts in cases where a lot of the time they're not necessary mm. anyway? Mm. So while in terms of pure incentives, this uh, student that asked me that question, they're you know, obviously a very good economic student because they're thinking about the incentives, but from a practical viewpoint, f most fans would you give them a choice of these mm. two po uh, po possible rule changes and they'll, I, I would imagine that the lion's share of opinion would be in favour of merely having the penalty shootout before extra time rather than before regulation time. Um. There's one more question there. Um, from a fan's perspective, wouldn't you expect the losing team of the penalty shootout to just um, go out and attack, but then the winning team will, you've got no other incentive but to just defend in the extra time? Uh, so well, it's that, not that you, you don't that? have any incentive to attack, it's just that you've got less incentive to attack than under the current rule. Uh, if it turns out that the team uh, you've got two teams that are not evenly matched, that you've got one clear favourite and that favourite wins the penalty shootout, chances are if they're really a good team, they should favour themselves to win extra time anyway. And they may be inclined to sit back a little bit more than under the current rule. But as we kind of lightly touched on before with Joe's question, well, that also gives them greater scope to be able to exploit weaknesses at the back of the other team's defence that are afforded by the fact that that other team is having to chuck all of their players forward anyway. Mm. So there are all these dynamics going on that we believe would lead to higher uh, attacking outcomes and goal scoring outcomes, uh, whether it's because it's the, the team on the counter attack or whether it's the team having to attack, uh, I think is almost, well it's not secondary, but ultimately what is of importance is those uh, uh, scoring outcomes. Um, I think this is a very good question and this goes back to the theoretical model by mm. Carrillo uh, which basically uh, identified these two opposing effects as you mentioned and, and to me one of the mm. surprises was uh, to find uh, the, the effect is as, as big and, and the reason is that 
uh, yes, you're going to have one team attacking more mm -hmm. and one team defending more. But what you are not going to have under the new rule is, is both teams defending and sitting back. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is what makes the, the biggest change. Because there's yeah. always going to be one team uh, that's going to be attacking. And if, if that team scores, it's going to be the other team attacking. Yeah. Again, Whereas currently you have both teams defending. Again, it's the net effect of the two. And if you have any problems trying to visualise the difference between uh, you know, this proposed rule and how the game would actually unfold compared to the current rule, imagine that you've got the new rule, so you've got this one team having to attack, and then they score. It's probably not that hard to visualise how things are then reverse because then the team that won the penalty shootout but is now behind in extra time themselves have to attack and now it's the other team that has to defend. So it's probably easy in that case to visualise how the dynamics and uh, you know, how the, uh, the flow of that game would, would turn around 180 degrees. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, our time is up. So let me thank our audience for their uh, insightful questions. Let me uh, thank you for attending and sharing your uh, well, thanks for having me, interesting Aaron. insights. And let me uh, finish by noting that uh, we, we, we hope that uh, the football authorities uh, are going to uh, consider the proposal. And in such a way, uh, football will still remain uh, the, the drama that it is and the drama that, that fans want it to be. But it will no longer be a, a tragedy. Thank you very much. Please uh, join, Lee, uh, join me in thanking Liam for interesting. Thank you.